Thank you, Ferran, very much, and thank you all for coming. Actually, the research creations for this uh, study, they shaped quite recently. Basically, in the way I'm putting the research creations now, they shaped uh, months ago. So this is very much a work under construction, and your uh, insight, your feedback will be very important for testing the validity of the main propositions I'm making in this research. So I will be looking forward to seeing what you think about those. As the maps are the signature symbol and style of the Electoral Integrity Project, <laughs> and as I'm very proud of being part of that project, I decided to start the presentation with a map. And here is the world map, actually, thanks to Marcus and also to Carla, who helped me to produce some of the visuals in this presentation, because myself, I'm completely incompetent of producing any graphs, any visual, any uh, things like that. So the map presents actually the world map with respect to those countries which empower their constitutional courts with uh, electoral adjudication functions. And uh, actually the model, well, judicial review of elections is almost universal. There is virtually no country which doesn't empower their courts court with, uh, with uh, adjudication of elections. Uh, well, pretty much uh, this is understandable. It's a fundamental right, right to judicial protection of and rights, and uh, electoral rights are largely also considered to be fundamental rights too. I mean, recently when the US Supreme Court said that uh, electoral rights are fundamental rights, the European Convention of Human Rights has a protocol one, article three, in which it uh, says electoral rights are fundamental rights. Uh, the other thing is that uh, constitutional courts specifically are adjudicating elections. This is not so uh, much a universal tendency, but as you can see, this has been uh, growing, and this already uh, embraces pretty much almost one third of the world. Actually, as of now, about 40 countries in the world empower their constitutional courts with functions of adjudicating elections. So the function was born in Austria, but the paradigmatic, most important, actually, classical models uh, emerged in France and in Germany. And no surprise, actually, the model uh, especially grew in uh, French, with the French influence in the French former French colonies in Africa. <coughs> but it also grew in uh, Southeast Asia with Thailand and in the Indonesia and in the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe in general. So this is a growing tendency, and if I'm looking at now those systems which are under construction, Tunisia, Tunisia for example, right now they're in the process of constitutional construction, and they're also heavily thinking about whether or not to empower constitutional courts with any electoral adjudication functions. So being a growing tendency, I asked myself, is it a justified model at all? Or do constitutional courts uh, really um, accomplish the function, accomplish the expectations of being good electoral dispute resolvers? So here come my research questions. Uh, in the more abstract way, I'm asking whether adjudication of electoral dispute by constitutional court has any implications for electoral integrity. And in the more specific way, I am asking whether constitutional courts, as opposed to general courts, are better shaped to uphold higher standards of electoral integrity. This is probably the most specific questions I'm posing. And then I'm also trying to answer, well, not exhaustively, but I'm trying to contribute evidence to the, the last question, which can be said a research question, whether uh, should constitutional designers in aspiring democracy empower constitutional courts with functions of electoral adjudication? This is relevant, for example, in Tunisia. This is very much relevant right now in Ukraine and in Armenia, where the constitutions are in the process of um, reconstruction. So these are basically more research questions. But for embarking on these research questions, I understand I need to provide some basic background about, first of all, what are constitutional courts? 
constitutional courts are specialized courts which are charged with the uh, mission of uh, reviewing, uh, with, with the mission of constitutional review. As such, constitutional review was born uh, in, in the United States in the beginning of the 19th century. But uh, the system as it evolved in, in the United States is called the diffuse system. There in that system, every single court actually can review uh, laws uh, against the background of constitutional uh, constitutions. As opposed to that, uh, constitutional courts, a specialized court, were born in Austria and the Czech Republic in the 1990 and 1920, actually. This is an invasion of Hans Kelsen. And these are designated courts. First of all, they, uh, they act here as a negative leg legis legislator, as Kelsen himself put this, because they very much perform a policymaker function. Uh, and uh, Alex Tonsley called them also third chamber of parliament. So they are not typical courts in this respect. They are more making uh, law, and in this respect, they are more legis legislative <coughs> than they are a court. A very important uh, aspect about this model is also that this constitutional court, they, they ma maintain the monopoly on constitutional review. So in those Kelsenian, that this uh, systems are called Kelsenian models, in the Kelsenian models, no other court but the constitutional courts can review laws uh, against the background of constitutions. And uh, currently, more than 70 countries in the world have, have this Kelsenian system. That is, only one court in the whole nation has the uh, power to review constitutionality of laws. This said, many constitutional courts also implement what is called, Tom Ginsburg calls them ancillary functions, or Professor Sadursky calls them marginal functions. Uh, they're not do only doing uh, constitutional review, they are not only policy makers, but they're also sometimes involved in adjudication of pure disputes. And these are very politicized disputes. For example, they are uh, resolving dispute between different branches of government, such as the government and, and, and the parliaments. They are resolving disputes about the separation of power, powers. They are resolving disputes about uh, impeachments of leaders. Finally, in many cases, as we saw in uh, more than 40 cases, constitutional courts are also resolving electoral disputes. So the two modes in which they are operating, the constitutional courts in this con context, have to be separated from each other. And this is a very important implication for the research questions I'm looking at. First of all, when they are, act as policy makers, this is a very different uh, framework from uh, their uh, responsibilities of acting as dispute resolvers. Why? And here are my uh, insights bear very much on the uh, studies by Martin Shapiro and Alex Tonsley, very uh, significant uh, researchers in the field who identify this uh, dispute resolving <laughs> framework in which they act and uh, connect this with the legitimacy of the courts. Constitutional courts as dispute resolvers are pretty different than constitutional courts as policy makers because when they are making policy or when they are making law while resolving dispute, this has very uh, big implications for their legitimacy of as uh, dispute resolvers because consider the triadic framework actually which they are presenting there is party A, which goes to the court against party B. So uh, in order for the court, uh, the third party here, to be legitimate, it needs to operate on the pre-existing law. This is making its legitimacy. This is, uh, this is the prerequisite for it to be the neutral arbiter in the case. While, while, while it starts making law while adjudicating those disputes, that legitimacy is actually very much undermined. This is a very important uh, issue that we need to take into consideration. Now, constitutional courts and elections. Again, the question I am posing in this research, whether they are good for electoral integrity at all, in general and as opposed to general courts, this question hasn't been specifically addressed by the scholarship. But there has been a lot of scholarship that looked at the question of constitutional courts in the context of democratization, especially in the post-communist world. 
and also uh, to less degree in the Asian cases, Tom Ginsburg looked heavily at the performance of constitutional courts and the role in democratization in Thailand, in Mongolia, and in, in, in Asian contexts. So again, none of these uh, studies specifically looks at the question whether they are good electoral adjudicators or not, but there are some insights which help us understand at least to identify the main pros and cons of involvement of constitutional courts in electoral disputes. So some of the most important uh, insights would be that probably constitutional courts are more independent than the general courts. First of all, general courts are very much dispersed. They may be operating in the local environment, like how constitutional courts are. It's one, one court. It's uh, sitting mostly in the capital cities. It's interacting with the national government rather than local authorities. So it has more power with respect to at least local courts. But there is a more fundamental argument here. Some scholars are arguing that since they have lawmaking power, they are, uh, in, through this fun uh, function, they are actually becoming more independent from the political branches because they're not bound by the law that is provided by the political branches. Then uh, there is a strong argument also that the constitutional court versus general court, they also enjoy better public trust. And finally, there is a pretty mainstream argument that they are better agents of constitutionalism, which is very much offered by a strong intuition. They are constitutional courts. But they are also more cos cosmopolitan. And here I can refer to Pippa Norris's most recent thesis that cosmopolitanism actually contributes to electoral integrity. Cosmopolitan, what is cos uh, cosmopolitan courts, constitutional courts? are more aware of uh, international standards, they're more applying the international standards than the general courts are doing. But then what are the disadvantages of constitutional courts involving in electoral disputes? Mostly the scholarship has been concentrating on one of these, that this is politicizing the constitutional courts. And politicizing, actually politicization is in many respects also associated with uh, better independence. But in this context, is more in, in, the, in the sense of partisanship. It makes constitutional courts more partisan, and this is basically not very much wanted. And the second important uh, disadvantage probably is related with the first one. Since they are getting very politicized, they are also becoming very politically active, activist. And as a result, in many cases, they are being attacked by the politicians. And in many countries, actually, the constitutional courts were attacked very heavily. In Russia, in Belarus, and in Kazakhstan, they were simply withdrawn from the constitution. The constitution was rewritten in a way that constitutional courts became far less important in the system. Recently, in Thailand, the same uh, happened. So the consideration is the institutional survival of constitutional courts at all. So these are the hypothetical uh, pros and cons never systematically addressed in the literature. <coughs> so I'm attempting to try doing this, so I'm not embracing the whole uh, spectrum of creations. I'm simply trying to co concentrate on uh, one of this. I'm trying to see whether there is empirical evidence to show that they are more constitutional, they are more open-minded. So this has also bearing on the other aspects too, at least on independence of constitutional courts. So the framework for doing that I am choosing is has very much to do with legalism. And my assumption here, or my hypothesis, which is getting uh, later to be tested empirically, is that legalism affects electoral integrity, and it, it has a very negative effect on electoral integrity. First of all, what is legalism? I define it as a code of conduct that is based on rules and commands which must be followed regardless of their origin, moral and political status, and the outcome. And uh, in this context, and indeed uh, in the most classical interpretation of the term, it has a lot to do with the, uh, separating law and morals. So for Judith Schklar, who is probably the most classical uh, scholar who studied legalism, a late Harvard professor, 
Legalism is actually an ethical attitude that holds moral conduct to be a matter of rule following and moral relationships to consist of duties and rights determined by rules. Actually, if you look at, again, we could go back to the world map, or we could identify it pretty many regions which were argued to be vulnerable to legalism very much, at least the post-communist region. And uh, there is a lot of scholarship which has argued that, and actually Sean demonstrated that post-communist uh, margin, mar Marxist ideology actually makes the systems very much vulnerable to legalism. Uh, legalism in general has a very um, bad, I would say, relationship with democracy. Even starting with Alexis de Tocqueville and starting with Max Weber, there are observations there that show that uh, this embedded conservatism of the legalist mindset has a very big contrast with democracy. And uh, also, Judith class actually makes the direct link between legalist mindset and uh, political repression and open political trials. I'm looking at the question, what is the relationship between legalism and electoral integrity, rather than the more general question, what's the relationship of legalism and democracy? And here, the definition of electoral integrity, again, I, again, I refer to people Norris and to the electoral integrity project, which defines actually electoral integrity, integrity in terms of inter international commitments and standards, which define the conduct of elections. And these are very much referring to the universal normative concepts rather than the rules. So electoral integrity is uh, largely a normative concept and it is based on uh, universal normative concepts which are also a part of the international law and they are also the part of the higher law and we can identify a higher law which is also the uh, framework for any law to any more specific rules of law to be drafted based on this higher law. So by definition, electoral integrity then uh, has a negative relationship with uh, legalism because while electoral integrity is a normative concept which relies on universally accepted moral concept, then uh, legalism in the electoral concept, in the electoral context is rather the mindset which is accustomed to stipulating and micromanaging uh, uh, the human behavior so very detailed codes and which uh, gives priority to this uh, micro rules over the concepts of the normative values which are guiding the process in general. And I want very much to illustrate what I'm saying on uh, practical examples and here my electoral uh, practice, electoral observation practice was very useful. Uh, relying on, totally relying on only on electoral observation, uh, ele international election observation reports. Nothing is here that I'm coming up with hy hy hypothetical examples. This is all documented. Uh, and relying on this evidence, I'm collecting some very illustrative cases to demonstrate how legalism actually affects electoral integrity. 85% of complaints uh, filed with the Central Electoral Commission in Ukraine were dismissed on minor technical grounds. This is probably making the probability of filing a complaint just simply very, very small. And what are the minor technical grounds? The uh, complaints were dismissed uh, for uh, omissions such as the person misspelled the name in the application or the person misspelled the passport series number, or the pe person indicated the name but forgot to name, to name the uh, name of his father in, in, in post in, in Russia, for example. The per you, you have to also indicate the name of your father. It's part of your full name. So if you say that you're Armen Mazmanian, but you fail to say that your father's name is also Arujan, then your, your application, your complaint is not considered. 
25% of candidates in Belarus, this is every fourth candidate, and otherwise 640 candidates in general in, in Ukraine were disqualified. They couldn't be a candidate because of minor omissions in application like the ones I mentioned. Several political parties in Russia just couldn't get registered because of very ridiculous mistakes that they've in, in their paperwork. But proceduralism and practice of uh, procedures and practices of electoral dispute resolution were considered to be overly formalistic even in such countries as the UK, so in Armenia. And signature verification process was too onerous in Germany and Russia. And again, I, I refer to electoral observation reports. So this mindset is actually having very direct uh, uh, effect on electoral integrity. I also have some very anecdotal evidence here. In Belarus, a uh, candidate was disqualified because he failed to declare shares, corporate shares, which were worth two euros. Worth two euros is a cup of coffee. And uh, another one was disqualified because he failed to declare a trailer. And the second one is also very interesting. A person was disqualified as a candidate because he actually failed to declare a car that he actually already sold. But the car was not yet registered on the name, in the name of the new owner. So the person officially was said that you have a car that you didn't declare. And this was a 10-year-old car. <coughs> and again, I'm referring to electoral observation report, reports by international observers. Nothing here is that I'm coming up with my own imagination. Uh, some other evidence, again, uh, based on international observer reports. Why some parties weren't re were not registered in Russia? Because they made mistakes and inaccuracies in documentation submitted because they indicate some ineligible party members. And actually, I was part of one of those who were drafting these reports. I know what is ineligible party members. For example, you need to have 1,000 members to register a party. You submit 1,000 names. Two of them are, for example, foreign nationals or dual citizens. They don't qualify. Because of these two, the whole 1,000 member list will be disqualified. The other one, which I don't exactly remember what the case was, but the definition itself is very ridiculous, overpaid registration fees. So parties were deregistered because they overpaid the fees. So if the fee is $100 and you paid $150, then the paperwork is considered incomplete and the party is not registered. The party is not registered is affecting electoral integrity in very direct terms. This man was a very um, important candidate, and again, in Russia. He was the former prosecutor general and uh, for many years. And after his retirement, he tried to become a candidate in parliamentary elections. And he was disqualified because in his application, in his biography, he mentioned that he is, uh, at the moment, he worked as a dean of a law, law department in a, law, in a university in Moscow. So he mentioned that he's the dean of the law department and a professor. While the records of the Electoral Commission showed that in his uh, labor book, in, in, in many post-Soviet countries, they're still applying these formal uh, certifications of your labor records. So every kind of employment that you have needs to be registered in a labor book. It's, kind of a passport. So his, in his labor book, the employment record indicated he's only the active team. So he said, I'm the dean and a professor, while the labor book only indicated that he is the dean. So he was disqualified. Again, a very um, uh, significant candidate in elections. The case actually went up to the European Court of Human Rights, and the European Court of Human Rights uh, found a violation of uh, his fundamental right to free elections. And this man was even a more significant candidate. He was uh, the prime minister of Russia for four years under Putin. But then his uh, 
uh, relationship with Putin was not so good after he resigned. And in 2008, he decided to run against Medvedev, who became the president. And he was disqualified because they found a lot of mistakes in the signature collection process. And again, I looked into the uh, process itself, and it was very, very much legalistic. So as you can see, legalism has very direct implications for uh, electoral integrity. And uh, apart from anecdotal evidence, I now want to try to conceptualize what I'm saying. And here, very, uh, two distinctions are very important to be made. Legalism and electoral fraud, the first intuitive connection is very direct, because everyone thinks that whatever I'm telling is more likely fraud than not, but this is not so obvious. Of course, in many respects, it is electoral fraud. In case of this guy, I'm sure it was revenge by Putin. In, the, in case of this guy, probably it was not revenge by Putin, but it was a revenge by someone else. Most likely in these two cases we had electoral fraud. But in cases like this, the person who was disqualified as a candidate because of failing to declare shares of worth two euros, actually it was a retired military officer, a non-significant candidate, non-party affiliate. And in general, this 640 candidates in Ukrainian elections who failed to qualify as candidate, most of them, and I was observing these elections too, most of them were not politically significant people, and in general these elections were uh, assessed to be very um, good, and uh, especially the Electoral Commission, which was qualifying the candidate, was uh, very independent. So, electoral, uh, so legalism affects elections whether or not it is electoral fraud. It can be electoral fraud, but it is not electoral not necessarily electoral fraud. This is a very important perspective. So this actually submits the, to the fact that legal culture, or in general the political cu culture, may have implications for electoral integrity. The second distinction that is very important to, make, to be made here is be between legalism and the rule of law. Again, uh, whatever I'm saying shouldn't be interpreted that law has to be devoid of formalism at all. Legalism is uh, defined as over formalism or um, unnecessary formalism. But otherwise, formalism has to be part of legal interpretation necessarily. So we need to distinguish between formalism and unnecessary formali formalism. Yeah. And what I'm saying doesn't mean that uh, those who are interpreting the law should also disregard the rule of law. Actually, again, if I'm going back to my examples, in many cases we could observe that these absurd outcomes were not a result of uh, following the rule of law. So the law actually didn't say that anyone who is failing to declare a single dollar has to be disqualified. The law is very general. It says that the candidates need to declare their property. And then there is a lot of discretion in interpreting this term. Property is a very uh, general term in this context. So you can interpret this term uh, in a way as the electoral administration did in Belarus. So if you fail to declare every, every single dollar or every single share, non-respecting non the fact that it is a very minor financial investment, then you end up having this absurd uh, effects, actually. So legalism is not necessarily following the rule of law, and one needs to carefully make the distinction between rule of law and legalism. Legalism is rather following unnecessary rules. First of all, it is stipulating unnecessary rules. And we also could see many examples in which uh, rules are so complicated and the co codes are so complicated that there is no real chance that the electoral participants can uh, uh, properly comply with these rules. But in the majority of cases, the laws are quite general and in very many cases they are very supportive, actually. In, 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 in Ukraine, for example, where so many candidates were, were 
is qualified because of minor omissions. The law actually says that the minor mistakes should not, must not be considered when disqualifying election. But the legalistic mindset is so strong that even that cannot overcome that problem. Now what I attempt in this study is because, again, my research question is comparing the courts. What I attempt in this study is to compare uh, constitutional courts, whether general uh, versus general courts, and to see whether these courts or the other courts are more legalistic. Of course, this is more providing support to the argument rather than we can directly say these are more legalistic, these are less legalistic. And what I'm doing for this is um, I selected so far 10 most recent decisions of constitutional versus higher general courts in the four countries indicated. I'm considering extending the samples to probably 15 or 20 most recent decisions, but I'm also considering extending the case studies to other countries too. But so far the, uh, the results are very uh, uh, self-speaking, so we, we can discuss it this later. So I'm uh, comparing constitutional courts versus higher general courts. So I'm not comparing constitutional courts versus any random court, but only with the higher courts that it can be more equal footing. And I'm looking at their decisions both in electoral context and in non-electoral context, which can provide more evidence. And what I'm doing, I'm counting uh, the citations and references that these courts applied in these decisions to universal authoritative normative concept because again these are the most important uh, normative concepts that are guiding uh, any law in general but also the electoral law especially. I'm uh, looking at the rate of the references to the principles of democratic governments, to constitutional concepts and norms, to norms of international law, including judgments of international courts, and to international and foreign best practice. Because when, when courts are actually looking at issues in the context of international best practice, you can imagine they're departing from the uh, literal meaning of the law. So they are in a search of the meaning of law. And they are departing from the literal meaning of law. And I'm also looking at the instances when they are doing balancing and proportionality. This is a very specific legal term, which uh, this is actually a judicial test, which uh, sets the test of uh, necessity in a democratic society. So when looking at restrictions of rights, courts are looking at whether these restrictions are necessitated in a democratic society. Again, by this exercise, they are departing from the literal meaning of the law. And uh, I'm actually proposing three hypotheses based on the intuition and based on the studies which were saying that uh, constitutional courts are probably more constitutionalist, they're more open-minded, they're more cosmopolitan, etc. The first hypothesis is that constitutional courts in any single country generally, so in non-electoral context, are more activist. I'm, I'm, I'm using the word activist in a very uh, conditional way. Activism has a very negative connotations very often in the judicial context. It means that uh, judges are departing from the law, they are becoming politicians. So I'm using this word conditionally until I find a better word. Probably you can help me to find a better word. So conditionally, they are more activist than the other higher courts are in the same country. Hypothesis, sec second hypothesis is that in the context of electoral dispute resolution, constitutional courts are more activist than the, same, the courts in the same countries. In general, they're more activist and they're, uh, they also apply constitutional norms more often than the general court, the general higher courts. Here, again, the distinction I'd made between triadic dispute resolution and policy making is very important because in hypothesis for uh, the first hypothesis, I'm looking at the constitutional courts acting as policy makers. So in this framework, they are more likely to be searching for the meaning of law and departing from the legal in interpretation or whatever, yeah, especially the laws that they are scrutinizing. But in, in, the, in case of hypothesis two and hypothesis three, I'm looking at constitutional courts as pure dispute resolvers. 
So here it, it is supposed that there is a pre-existing law, and here whether it is a supreme general court or whether it is a constitutional court, they are supposed to bear on the same pre-existing electoral law. So a process history then uh, compares, um, again, in the electoral context, constitutional courts in those countries which empower their constitutional court with uh, electoral adjudication functions with non-constitutional higher courts in countries where uh, constitutional courts do not perform this function. So I compare constitutional co court of Armenia and Moldova when they're deciding electoral disputes with, con with Supreme Courts in Russia and Ukraine, respectively. Now, based on those exercises, I'm arriving to very, I would say, shocking uh, results. And here are the results for hypothesis one, which is more or less offered by strong intuition, but so I was expecting this result, but I was not expecting the contrast to be so high. In general, the Constitutional Court of Armenia is a few times more active than the Cassation Court of Armenia, which is the higher non-constitutional court in Armenia. Actually, the rate is 7.1, meaning that in the 10 decisions I reviewed, the Constitutional Court referred to all these uh, concepts, norms of international law, law etc. I even excluded constitutions, references to constitutions, because it is supposed that the constitutional courts re refer to constitutions, it's quite na natural. So even excluding uh, references to constitutions, the Constitutional Court of Armenia referred to, to international law mostly and the concepts of democratic governments and uh, best practices for more than 70 times in, in 10 decisions. So this makes the rate of reference is 7.1. While the Supreme Court of Armenia did it for 30 times, so the rate is 3.0. And the contrast is very big, but the contrast is even more shocking in Russia and in Ukraine. Uh, the Constitutional Court of Russia actually made 98 references in 10 cases. So in nine, nine reference per decision, while the Supreme Court of Russia made only three references to extra statutory sources of interpretation in 10 decisions. Only three references in 10 decisions. It's a huge contrast. The contrast is, even, uh, is big also in Ukraine, though you can see that the Constitutional Court of Ukraine in the meaning of this research is much more legalist than the Constitutional Court of Russia and Armenia, but it is, again, much more open-minded than the Supreme Court of Ukraine. We're moving to hypothesis two. Constitutional Court of Armenia is applying to extra statutory sources of interpretation, significantly at a higher rate than the, uh, admin the administrative court of Armenia, which is the higher electoral court. And um, uh, my results for Moldova are under construction, but uh, the preliminary results show the same kind of contrast. And more specifically, the Constitutional Court of Armenia is applying constitution. Here it is relevant because it is a dispute resolution framework. It is applying constitutional norms more often than the Administrative Court of Armenia, again at very significant intervals. Hypothesis three. Constitutional Court of Armenia and Constitutional Court of Moldova, when reviewing the electoral dispute, are significantly more open-minded than the Constitutional Court of uh, this, uh, the Supreme Court of Ukraine and the Supreme Court of Russia. And this is also true about applying the const specifically the constitutional norms. The Constitutional Court are significantly more activist than non-constitutional higher courts. Basically, uh, relying on this data, I then make the conclusions, and the conclusions are that uh, non-general courts are significantly more reluctant to apply extra statutory sources of law, and this leads to 
conclusion that they are more likely to be legalists, significantly more likely to be vulnerable to legalism than constitutional courts. It also indicates that constitutional courts are significantly more cosmopolitan. Again, you will refer to Pippa Norris, meaning that they apply international law at much higher rate than uh, the general courts do. And finally, they are better agents of constitutionalism, electoral constitutionalism, especially than the non-general courts. And I think this has direct bearings for the studies of electoral integrity, especially for institutional design of dispute resolution systems. Now, a few more uh, observations, and this is my vision of how to develop the research further. First of all, I would like to see what are the patterns of legalism elsewhere, because I'm mostly concentrating on the post-communist world, even on the post-Soviet world. I'm sure the patterns are still there in Eastern Europe and Central Europe. I would probably like to see what are the patterns of legalism in uh, now EU members, former communist countries, but also probably, say, Germany and even France, because, again, uh, they are probably going to have some patterns of legalism there, too, because of some uh, cultural heritage, too. I'm going to try the same in, uh, the, in other regions of the world. So this is one way of developing the research further. Probably I need to extend the, sa the samples, but maybe I need your advice here. Given this stark contrast, do you think I need to extend the samples and look at more decisions or the 10 decisions submitted enough evidence? And finally, I want to extend the case studies themselves. Initially, I was thinking about Azerbaijan and Georgia. These are the same region, the same patterns of legalism, etc. And given the contrast and that the hypotheses are confirmed in all cases, in, in all dimensions, probably I will arrive to the same result. But probably there makes sense to look at Central Europe, to look at Middle East and North Africa. Maybe Algeria might be a good example, and finally Indonesia, and this would make my, my study more comparative and more uh, global in its application. Thank you. Thank you, Arman. Uh, so,